You may not realize how many poor people there are in our world. There are millions of people still going to bed hungry at night all over our world. I've been in India. On those Good evening. My name is Joe Robinson, and I am the rector at Christ Church here in Cambridge, and delighted that uh, we are having this program tonight, and delighted to welcome all of you to be here with us. Being rector means that you are the one who is responsible. However, if you know many members of my congregation, you know that's an entirely different thing from being in control. <laughs> so they put me up to speaking in moments of things like this when I'm not in my element, and it makes me just a little nervous behind the ears here, I can always tell. It's a special event, though, and a great thing for us to be remembering. And it's with a great deal of pride in a working group within our congregation whose focus is on issues of social justice and community outreach that this has happened tonight. These good folks have labored hard to bring this night together, and they've also been very busy with other projects of import. Their efforts in favor of a permanent restroom facility on or around Cambridge Common are getting some positive reaction all over the city. You may have seen our cars. <laughs> we love toilets, and so do homeless people in Cambridge. The difference is, we have toilets. Many of them do not. And while the city welcomes them to live here with us, they are not being responsible at the present for providing the most rudimentary conveniences and necessities for their life here. So they're working on that. They're working on some other good things, too. They've established a new website. <coughs> I have a visual aid. <laughs> and you can uh, have one of these tonight by, I think they're at the table just outside the door. Is that where they are, Webb? Or if you see Webb Brown just after this, uh, she'll be happy to give you some of them. They've gotten almost 500 cards and letters sent to the city of Cambridge about this particular project. Uh, some of them are receiving leadership training from our Diocesan Leadership Training Institute, and all of them are dedicated to holding up the tradition of Christ Church being active both close to home and far away for the good of all God's people. Please join me as they stand and we show our appreciation to the members of our Walking in Love community. celebration commemorating the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. As an eight-year-old, my parents took me to one of the small town rallies in Mississippi that culminated in that monumental gathering on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. I feel blessed and incredibly humbled to have traveled a road that brings me also to witness this celebration. Tonight, we welcome Priscilla Lee and her committee to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington, and we look forward to hearing more in the months to come, the weeks to come, about that historic event and the important part played in its beginnings by Bayard Rustin. Please help me welcome members of that committee. Where are you? Please stand. so that people can get uh, paperwork from you afterwards tonight. <laughs> because they have flyers too. Oh wait, visual aid. <laughs> See, I don't do that much on Sundays. <laughs> We've just celebrated Pentecost in our church, and one of its themes is the cloud of witnesses who heard the good news spoken by disciples, each in their own language. Tonight we're blessed by the presence of our own cloud of witnesses, some we owe and others we do not know, here in attendance. Now please reserve your applause to we've named all as we honor those tonight who attended the original event some 50 years ago. Among them, Ed Chase and Faith Chase. Horace Goodrich, 
uh, who's not in attendance with us tonight. And Tom Snow, his wife, Leia, are here with us tonight. Tom was 11, and his father was on staff here at Christ's Church at that time. So, <laughs> Clergy children, my yes. In those very first, uh, let's see. Are there others in the room that were here for that original uh, press conference? People that we don't know might be with us tonight. Jeff, Jeff Brown was here. I didn't know that. I told you you were forty-two. <laughs> Congratulations, we're glad that you're here. Christ Church has been raising eyebrows on Garden Street since our history here began in 1759. In those very first years, an English soldier was killed during a minor skirmish close to the common. It's never been determined if he was killed by friendly fire or enemy fire. But a public furor arose over the question of his proper local burial, not like one of late in Boston. Members of Christ Church opened a space in their family crypt located below the floor of the church for his final resting place. And as far as we know, he is still resting there. It was a risky proposition, unpopular in its day, and perhaps in that was the seeds of shaping Christ Church even then. So by the year 1967, it would have seemed quite natural on some level that the rector would, would have welcomed the opportunity to have Dr. King speak in our space. And still, he probably would not have realized in that moment that he was in some way changing the character of this space in issuing that invitation. For you see, ours is a tradition that puts much weight on holy places, on pilgrimage, and on remembrance of what happened at a certain moment and in a certain place in the church's history. For us, holiness of place is attached to important human events that happened in the church, rather than its grandeur of scale and architecture. The Reverend Murray Kenny, then rector, provided the seeds for this holy ground when he invited doctors King and Spot to hold their press conference here. We look forward to learning more about this event along with you this evening. But for us, this is a remembrance of a saint as well. Dr. King has been in the circle of saints in our church for many years, with a day of remembrance on April 4th, the date of his assassination in Memphis. And we honor the memory of his presence here with a memorial plaque and icon installed in 2001. We are so blessed to have you be a part of this historic place, and we look forward with God's grace to the writing of more of its history tonight. Dr. Richard Parker, noted author, economist, and professor at the Kennedy School of Government, a member of this parish, and the chair of Walking in Love, will take up the welcome and instructions from here. But first, I ask you to pause for a moment with me as we offer the prayer especially written for Dr. King's Saints Day. Let us pray. Almighty God, by the hand of Moses, your servant, you led your people out of slavery and made them free at last. Grant that your church, following the example of your prophet, Martin Luther King, may resist oppression in the name of your love, and may secure for all your children the blessed liberty of the gospel of Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, first, uh, I'm a preacher's kid, and you should never follow a preacher, and you'll see why, having listened to that wonderful introduction by Joe. I want to speak simply. I want to explain that the impetus for this gathering tonight was Dr. King's coming to this very room in the spring of 1967 to carry the civil rights movement forward into cooperation with the burgeoning anti-war movement of the time. 
Our purpose tonight is not to look back solely historically on an event in the past, but to use it as a keystone moment to think about the present and the future. Unimaginable in 1967, we have an African American president. That African American president is saddled with the burden of not one, but two wars ongoing, at risk of a third in Syria. We're also in a country that is deeply divided in some ways as we were in 1967, although we sometimes seem to forget that, imagining at any given moment that it's the now that is the time when we are most divided. We are a people who need to understand our past in order to shape a common future. And so I'm hoping this evening out of this talk initially by Professor Alkovitz and then the discussion of the four of us that follows, you will gather a sense of why it is that Dr. King came here to join civil rights and peace and economic and environmental issues in a way that can, once again, shape our common future. So, without further ado, let me invite to the stage Dr. Gar Alperwitz, Professor of Public Policy at the University of Maryland, a distinguished historian and economic policy theorist, and someone as I count as a friend for the last 30 years. Gar. Thank you for having me. Um, what I'd like to do first is give you a sense of just a bit of the history about what happened here happened. And then perhaps to suggest uh, at least one person's way of reflecting on Dr. King's evolution, not only in that he took on the war question at great, great peril, but how he evolved on virtually every front in the name of his belief, and how simultaneously he was attacked at every level. And we forget the struggle that each makes. So instead of thinking about this evening in terms of why we ought to move forward on issues, which we must do, I would suggest, there is another question which is existential, which we all face when we think about how he personally advanced against risk himself that we actually need to confront, I would suggest, and it is hard to do. So first, just a little bit of history just to give you the background. Uh, I met Dr. King as a young aide in the Senate working in 1964 at the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party fight in Atlantic City. Some of you gray hairs may remember that fight or whether people would be seated or not. I was working for a liberal senator, Gaylord Nelson, Oh. And he let me be loose to help the party and to help Dr. King, even though President Johnson was fighting to keep these, these folks down. And he, at that convention, you may recall, the final solution was to offer two votes to the Mississippi Freedom Dem Democratic Party. And he was cornered because he agreed with the party that they should not accept this. And yet he felt nationally he had to make some kind of compromise and he was radically booed by the activists. And he was not always welcomed. And at that particular moment, that's when I met him and began to work very slightly with him on economic matters with, you know, that, with uh, Andy Young and Bernard Lee and, and Dr. King on economic issues thereafter. But I remember the challenge, and I am speaking to each of us as we think about taking difficult positions the challenge that brings with it that he himself bore and understood in this odd situation. He moved forward, obviously, in many different ways over time. Most importantly, most importantly, in taking on the war in Vietnam. And what happened, we were working here, I was at the Institute of Politics at that time, I had been in the State Department and left the State Department because of the war, and I was here, and people were very frustrated what could we do? What, what might we do? And so we thought maybe we could start some kind of an organizing drive. Dr. Erwin Rosenberg, who happens to be here, called him a good friend of mine at that point. He said, I'm so angry I could go ring doorbells. <laughs> <laughs> and indeed, that was a, at that point a strategy. Go ring doorbells and see if the neighbors would do something. And what you would find when you rang doorbells is people <laughs> here in Cambridge, but also in many parts of the country, the person would say, you know, I'm against the war but nobody else on the street is. And you ring another doorbell, 
Mm -hmm. I'm against the war, but nobody else on the street. So you could discover and create from home. So that was what was called Vietnam Summer, a summer project to start doorbell ringing on the one hand, but also burning draft cards. Some people in the Alliance wanted to do that. And we asked Dr. King to come here to help kick it off. And he and Ben Spock, who was the other at that point, very big war, the anti-war leader, joined and did that. And then left, left this room to go to Fred Wiseman's house and ring doorbells. It's the mm -hmm. first sign, mm -hmm. so we know Fred. That's how it happened, but it, that's the story, the technical story, and those are the facts. But what really happened was something much different, of course, is that he had gone through a transformation. And it was a terribly difficult transformation to come out against the war and to come out in a very strong way against <coughs> opposition on all fronts. His first challenge on the war was to say we should stop the bombing. And he was denounced by the Southern Leadership, Christian, Southern Christian Leadership Council, his own organization, for saying we should stop the bombing. And when he moved forward in, at, the, at the Riverside Church speech, which preceded the events that took place in this room, he was denounced on every single front. And it was a great risk to the Civil Rights Movement at that point because he was taking on the Johnson administration and he needed Johnson, he felt. But he took it on and opened up a very large space for a much bigger debate against great controversy and against great difficulty. And I think great difficulty we often forget for him personally. He went through an existential struggle in all of this and in some ways and I, I'm at a church, so I have to say I'm talking to the person in your chair and my chair. He went through challenging himself to go deeper and deeper against opposition on all fronts, including his colleagues. Now, that is a lesson all of us need to ponder because it is comfortable not to ponder that lesson in many different ways, even now on many different issues. So I think that's one of the things that we ought rightly to remember about this event and about those days, not simply the broadening from civil rights to anti-poverty to the war issue, which is the sequence, but the existential requirement of confronting opposition in a challenging way, in a very challenging way, as you went forward. I want to give you a sense of that because one of the things about this evening that has been a, a joy and a and a remembrance, is I went back and read some of the attacks. I read also the speeches, and, and just to remember what that time was like. This is, this is Lawrence Spivak. The old folks here will know that was the man who managed for many, many years Meet the Press, which was a very important institution in those days. Isn't this an indication that its sit-in strikes are doing the race, the Negro race, more harm than good, Dr. King? That's the first kind of attack. Dr. King, this is by another one in Meet the Press. In your own book, you say you thoroughly studied the writings of Karl Marx. Now, I'd like to know just where does communism or collectivism fit into your program of resistance? This is Meet the Press, not right-wing not right -wing attacks out of the park. This is what he was facing as he went forward. President Truman, the march on Selma, oh, that's a silly thing, can't accomplish a darn thing, denouncing him. Haynes Johnson, a liberal writer, the Washington Post, Washington Star at that point became a liberal writer for the Washington Post. And this again is on Meet the Press, the national movement. Dr. King, to go back to the question of civil disobedience, some of your strongest critics have charged that you yourself are responsible for part of the urban violence that afflicts us recently in the riots. And that by advocating civil disobedience, the logical and inevitable effect of that is to create more violence by your own people. Isn't that so, Dr. King? And of course, Joseph also reporting that King was still accepting communist collaboration and even communist advice. We tend to forget this was the nature of establishment attack, not right-wing attack, that he was enduring at this particular time. Now, I bring this up just to remember it, but also I think the times that we are now facing and whether or not we recall only the civil rights great hero rather than the person who challenged what had to be challenged, both the war, the economic issues, the existential issues, I bring it up to remember that he actually was able to do that 
against the tax from his own people, including SCLC, and of course on the left as well. <coughs> the question, of course, again, is personal, whether or not in our own lives we actually face this, the broadening of issues, and further development on ourselves being willing to take that on. Let me give you a little bit more. And of course, when he, when he took on the war issue at Riverside Church, and here, this is Life Magazine. Most of his speech was a demagogic slander that sounded like a script from Radio Hanoi. <laughs> Life magazine. Again, a centrist, not the, not the far right, attacking him. So it is, it is well to recall some of this discussion and some of this quality of the time that he faced and his own evolution. He persevered. In, this chir in the church at Riverside Drive, the Riverside Church speech, is incredible, and I urge and suggest you all reread it, because he opens up much larger dimensions, and this is what struck me in going back, the growth pattern against challenge, which we all have to quit, struggle with, not just the issues, the existential problem. Here he says, I am convinced that if we are to get on the right side of the world revolution, Get on the right side of the world revolution. That was the issue. There is a world global revolution, and he understood that. We as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of our own values. We must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. When the machines and computers and profit motives and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. And then he got deeper. True compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It is not haphazard and superficial. It comes to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. That is not like talk when you actually read carefully where he was going near the end of his life. The edifice needs restructuring. <coughs> he was not simply talking about poverty and not simply talking about the war that had to be stopped. <coughs> he was saying we ought also to be on the side of world revolution of the peoples around the world who could not otherwise succeed very radical stuff, opened up from a Christian perspective in deep humility, but also willing to take the heat, and there was a lot of heat. And then he said, we in the West, the people who, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. We in the West must support these revolutions. Our only hope today lies in our ability to recapture the revolutionary spirit. Notice that language. It is not the language we usually associate with Dr. King. And it's not simply about civil rights, and not simply about civil disobedience, and not simply about Martin Luther King and his respect for Gandhi. It is a larger perspective that took him near the end of his life against the attacks that were always being made, I think, to a very different place. I encountered him personally at a couple other points in time, mostly around economic issues, and then recently, in preparing for a book that I've been working on, on these questions, I began reading some of the things that have been discovered over time about where he was going near the end of his life. And I was amazed to hear and to read something further about his sense that there was a systemic problem, which I might have gotten a glimmer of from his talk about the world revolutions of the poor people around the world. But in fact, he was opening much deeper issues than any of us have wanted to open. So let me give you a few things I've discovered about that. Something is wrong with capitalism. This is 1964, it's 1967. Something is wrong with capitalism as it now stands. We are not interested in being integrated into this value structure. Power must be relocated. A radical redistribution of power must take place minutes of the National Advisory Committee, SCLC training, November 24th, 1967. Speaking to his staff, one member recalled, 
King asked us to turn off the tape recorder. He talked about what he called democratic socialism. And I can't say this publicly, he said. If you say I said it, I'm not going to admit to it. <laughs> he talked about the fact that he didn't believe that capitalism, as it was constructed, could meet the needs of poor people. This is where it gets tougher and more interesting as he moves on. He didn't believe could meet the needs of poor people. And that what we might need to look at was a kind of socialism, but a democratic kind of socialism. He didn't know what that was. But, and then here's publicly, which is really interesting because he had just told his staff he wasn't going to be quoted publicly. This is at the speech of the Negro American Labor Council. Call it democracy, or call it democratic socialism, but there must be a better distribution of wealth within this country for all God's children. I don't think he knew what he meant by socialism. I don't think it was clear whether that was Sweden or some new kind of socialism, but it is definitely clear that he understood a far more radical change in the distribution of power and wealth was necessary, both globally, we must be on the side of the revolutions, and in America. We are dealing with issues, this is 1968, January, we are dealing with issues that cannot be solved without the nation undergoing a radical redistribution of economic power. The Dr. King I remember is a man who did move against great odds to challenge the war issues. He was not simply the pacifist civil rights leader that is glowingly remembered in some quarters. He was also a man willing to take challenge from his own people, left and right, and I think with great difficulty. I think he struggled more and more at this difficulty because it was painful to him to move on. But the most interesting and most important challenge I think he offers up is this existential challenge. The challenge both to move beyond simple ideas, simply of civil rights, to deeper ideas <coughs> involved the, <coughs> involving the wars that we now face, to still deeper ideas about a global problem that cannot be solved without fundamental change around the world in many, many, many poor countries. A very radical conception of what it would be required if we were to move on. And domestically, also some fundamental restructuring in a society in which a mere 1% is more income than the bottom 180 million. Something very challenging to our way of thinking about politics <coughs> as well. When he died, he had in his pocket a speech that he was about to give, and it, in it was the Ten Commandments of Vietnam. Later, Coretta Scott King read the commandments, and I'll read you only a couple of them by way of final closing. One, thou shalt not believe in military victory. Two, thou shalt not believe in a political victory. Then he went on to Vietnam. Thou shalt not believe that they, the Vietnamese, love us. He was talking about the war directly. <coughs> Thou shalt not believe that the generals know best. Thou shalt not believe that the world supports the United States. Thou shalt not kill. <laughs> that I was not when I was still in high school. 
I went to Andrew Jackson High School. There were 6,000 students in my class. There were 14, excuse me, 6,000 students at the school, 1,447 in my graduating class. And in 1967, I was thinking a lot about going to college. Got admitted to um, Radcliffe College, which was the female part of Harvard, the lesser ranked female part of Harvard. Um, <laughs> and I, I had um, no particular interest in going to Radcliffe, but I felt that I had to go to vindicate my own father's experience. My father had uh, been accepted to Harvard College in 1929. He went to the um, first day of school to register and they told him that he had failed to submit a photograph with his application and therefore he could not live in the dorms and that then led one thing to another so that he had to get a job because they wouldn't give him any kind of financial aid. And he ended up going to, um, to Harvard for two years. He said the only person who would speak to him voluntarily was Ralph Bunch. And that included people that he had gone to uh, Boston English High School with, who were on the um, high school um, journal with my dad, and even though they knew him, because Harvard at that time was so segregated, that when he was trying to engage with people he had gone to high school with, they just looked right over him and said, what book do you want? Not looking at him. They gave him the book he wanted, and then they went to the next person. I say all that because I felt that for me, I had to come to Radcliffe College to vindicate my father's experience. He ended up going to, um, for two years at Harvard and then went to City College. And <coughs> I have to say that when I got to Radcliffe, I was somewhat disappointed because one of the major questions that the women in the dorm were discussing is whether men could come into the dormitory and, st and get in beyond a uh, carpet that was put at the front door. The carpet was not a very large carpet. <laughs> and as I recall, my first experience with one of the uh, conversations at Radcliffe College was women uh, complaining that the reason they don't, didn't want the men to come past the threshold is that they wanted to be able to walk around in their slips. So that's what I was doing in 1967. <laughs> Well, I was going to say one other thing, which is, if we get to 1968, then I can tell you some better stories. Give <laughs> 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 1968. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I actually brought... I'm talking about Clark, it's very depressing. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what I brought is December 1968, sit-in at Fay House. This is a sit-in by um, 27 black women at Radcliffe College, and there's a picture actually right here. I was one of those 27 black women at Radcliffe College. And, what's that? Mm -hmm. Well, that's if you count all four years. <laughs> So we were there um, trying to get the administration to focus on admitting more black uh, students, not just women students, although Radcliffe was a separate admissions program. And when I came across this, I just felt really proud that um, we were willing to sit in at Fay House and take on the president <coughs> of Radcliffe College. We got nowhere, but um, <laughs> it still felt good. <laughs> I'd like you to join the discussion because you, you've got a history both as a civil rights and anti-war activist going back to the 1960s. You were a member of CORE, and CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, had many disagreements with SCLC and Dr. King about his leadership uh, in the civil rights movement. Can you help me? So I, um, I'd be happy to talk about that, but I, 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 I want to uh, start with this year. Um, 
I have to say, I, I was in Boston. Um, uh, I started organizing. I went to school around here, um, but that had very little to do with my, with my history. Um, but uh, by 1964, I had worked for the Conservation Quality Corps. Um, and like a number of, of, of workers in that part of the civil rights movement, we had become, we had moved uh, more and more away from organizing around uh, racial, uh, ending racial discrimination. Um, especially those of us who worked in the North realized that that was not the issue that when you knocked on people's doors, they wanted to talk about first. Certainly it wasn't overt racial discrimination. And many of us became, but we started to call ourselves, because we wanted to have another name, uh, so we called ourselves community organizers. I got interested in the Northern Student Movement, and I came to Boston in uh, the summer of 64 uh, to work for the Northern Student Movement and, and organize here. Uh, and then while I was doing that organizing, um, one of the things, of course, that young people talk to me a lot, especially young boys and men, um, talk to me a lot, was the war. And then it was the war. Um, and it was this, uh, and they knew about the war because they knew, they knew if it wasn't happening to them immediately, they had friends who were being drafted, and those friends who were being drafted were sent, being sent to Vietnam. Um, to, uh, when I, um, years later, uh, when I got elected to the Massachusetts legislature, I decided that um, I better get my FBI records. Um, because I just don't want anything popping up um, while I'm up here uh, at the State House uh, that I didn't know about. So I, and and that, they came in very handy because they remind you of things that you, you forget about completely. And, <laughs> and, and so things like, so I, and so I, I, and I just, for this event, I went and dug up the folders that I had gotten now 25, 30 years ago. Um, and, uh, and, and in reading those, um, I uh, got a sense of two things. The first thing was, hardly anything in those records had to do with my civil rights work. Uh, the FBI got interested in me when I started organizing against the war in Vietnam. Um, and uh, so, so I would get so... Uh, I have things here to say, your investigation of rushing, and then somebody else, but that person is blank, is the, now marked, is, is a big magic marker filtered through it, should be conducted in accordance with instructions concerning the investigation of members and employees of SNCC, I'm not sure why, set forth in the Bureau, Sir Tell, to all offices dated October, August 21, 1967, and it goes on and on and on to tell them how they should be reporting me. Results of your investigations of rushing should be submitted in report form to reach the Bureau by February 10th, 1968. Sort of, and, and, and then we, I would get all of these wonderful reminders um, uh, of a, an anti-war rally was held on the steps of the Student Center, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Cambridge, with approximate, from approximately noon to 2 p.m. This is April 12th, 1967. Uh, the, uh, on featured speakers at this rally were Howard Zinn, Lincoln Shepherd, Byron Rushing of the Massachusetts Council of Churches, which I was all work, working for at the time. Um, and then it goes on to describe this. I was once joking with Howard about, about all of this stuff. And, and I said that they even sent me the fly. I even got a copy of the flyer for that. <laughs> and Howard said, oh, you have it? I've been looking for it. <laughs> the, for us who were organizing at the time, what we were struck with, of course, was the disproportionate number of African Americans who seemed to be going to Vietnam. Um, at the, in the beginning of uh, when I first got involved in this work, um, about uh, black people made up about 13% of the armed forces. Um, and that was quite remarkable. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the integration of the armed forces had, really, had, 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 had taken off really after Korea, the Korean War. And so about 13% of the armed forces were uh, black people. Um, but 
of the combat troops in Vietnam were black. Um, and, in, uh, and, and the draft went the same way. Um, in 1964, about 18 percent of eligible white men were, had been drafted. 30 percent of eligible black men had been drafted. All right? now, we can, and we can sit around and we can talk about, oh, this is not race. They're just, you know, they, there are more white guys in college. Right? There are more white guys in seminary. Right? All of that kind of stuff. All the reasons why you can get out of the draft. Right? And this continued. So by 1967, the year that we're talking about, with the draft going full blazes, 30% of eligible whites were in, had been drafted. 67% of eligible black young people had been drafted. And so when we had started that organizing, we were talking about that organizing not from the point of view of whether this war was right or wrong, it was whether people, whether black people were being forced into a disparate uh, 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 accessibility into uh, the armed forces for the, the sole reason of being in this dangerous situation. And so one of the first things we did, though I've lost this, and the FBI doesn't have a copy of it either, it seems, <laughs> but we put out a button and it said, the Viet Cong never called me nigger. <laughs> and that was, one of the, that was one of our first organizing tools uh, in, in this work. There were some of us, of course, who talked about the war from, from political and ideological positions. There was uh, Ho Chi Minh, among radical black people, was well, uh, was well known because, unlike Mao, Ho Chi Minh had actually been to the United States. Um, those of you who, who, who are Ho Chi Minh fans all know this. That, he, that, that in around 1911, Ho Chi, Ho Chi Minh was, was, uh, decided to, to he, he decided to go to France and actually and, and got on a freighter to go to France. Gets to France and can't get in, and decides that, that this is a great idea of staying on freighters and going around the world. And goes around the world. Comes to New York and lives in Harlem, and then comes to Boston. We're not sure where he lived. We think he might have lived in Chinatown, but he worked at the Parker House. I have this wonderful image of Ho Chi Minh. Everybody knows who Ho Chi Minh was, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I, have to, I have to do this sometimes. <laughs> right? I have this wonderful idea of Ho, Ho, see, of Ho Chi Minh uh, working at the Parker House, making Parker House rolls. <laughs> so that was that. that and, and so when, when, when Martin Luther King comes here, I don't remember. I don't remember. Um, it was like, it was, it was like, this was Cambridge, it was just a someplace else. We were organizing at a very grassroots level. Um, this was a little too, it probably was a little too intellectual for us. I couldn't imagine bringing anybody over, any of these young guys over to Cambridge, right? And then go to this, and go to what was, we thought was going to be Harvard and come over here, right? We, but we were doing all of this work to try to get these guys to make decisions about a whole bunch of things because they were getting, becoming conscious about this incredible systemic discrimination against black people in this country. I want you to. So I'm married to a man who um, was in Vietnam four years, one month, 11 days active duty. And he was in the Navy, he volunteered for service, and I think in some ways it was a really good experience. I hate to admit that because obviously neither he nor I thought that the war in Vietnam was legitimate. But he had to go into the Navy because he was the son of, um, he had two parents, but he was basically brought up by his mom who uh, worked in a chitlin factory would send her sons to the movies on Saturdays with 10 cents. The movie cost nine cents and then they had a penny to buy their candy and that was supposed to keep them for the whole Saturday uh, morning and afternoon so they could watch lots and lots of uh, cartoons. So I, I, I understand exactly what um, you're saying but on the other hand I also think that when we're talking about King's uh, war on poverty or his effort to 
bring the um, American people to an understanding and a commitment to do something about poverty that in this ironic and twisted way, being, and my husband was not drafted, he volunteered. And he volunteered um, basically because he, that I heard somebody say because he didn't have any money. <laughs> but so I just think that there's the reality here that we have to acknowledge in terms of the important role that the military plays for poor, um, not just African Americans, but uh, Latinos and um, white Americans. I, I want to ask you to just build on that line uh, because we moved from a period where I don't know. No, it's, I mean, the United States military was segregated up until the end of the 1940s. And here at the height well, of the... Well, segregated until we, it was, the United States military was segregated until about the Korean War. We let black people in and we said that they could be in this whole kind of thing. I mean, the, the, the Navy did not become integrated until the 60s, right? I mean, my brother was in the Navy. I mean, my brother spent uh, a career Navy person. That's one of the things he did was to try to, he did, it was the work to get the Navy to figure out ways of being integrated. Right. So now let's fast forward to today. We've had an African American head of the armed forces in Colin Powell. We've had a national security advisor, Secretary of State, and Condoleezza Rice. And yet we still find ourselves in war. It happens to be in the Middle East or South Asia rather than Southeast Asia. We've made progress in dismantling the apparatus and laws associated with racism, but something about that progress has not yet transformed itself into a way that we are able to think collectively about the cost of war. What's going on? Well, I don't think it's just the cost of war. I think it's also the cost of racism. I mean, that even this war now is being fought disproportionately by young men and women who are uh, poor and also black, or poor and also uh, Latino, poor and white. And that those are the people who are going into the military at this point. I don't think it's just, um, you know, I, I don't think we know in this country what to do about poverty, right? <coughs> Except to hide it. Or, or hide it or to, um, in some ways, create it as its own war zone. Meaning that, that poor whites believe that it's poor blacks who have taken their American dream from them. This is something that, um, there's a really good book about the Arkansas desegregation case in 1957. It's by a woman named Beth Roy, and it's called Bitters in the Honey. And she describes interviewing white people who had been going to Central High School in 1957 when it was first integrated by a group of very carefully selected black people who were very um, well-mannered and very um, and, and very well prepared. And she found 30 years after that, meaning in the 1980s, because Little Rock Central High School was desegregated in um, 1957, she found that the whites who went to Central High School were still furious about what had happened. Mm -hmm. And they felt that their opportunities to be associated with middle class and upper middle class whites was destroyed by <coughs> desegregation because at the same time that they uh, desegregated Central High School, the upper class whites built their own high school called Hall High School in the nicer part of Little Rock. Private, private high school. It was a public. It was a public high school. So for the poor and working class whites at Central High School, desegregation meant downward economic mobility. So that takes us back to Gar because that's an intersection. Of, that's not an issue of race. That's race and class coming together in a violent way in some sense, right? Gar. You certainly know yeah. a lot about the It's why I wanted to introduce some of those, those uh, unexpected quotes from King. And I actually found them surprising that he was opening up. The, he was opening up systemic issues and the argument that you couldn't get there from here without somehow changing the system. And I felt very uncomfortable about that, and that probably makes a lot of people uncomfortable even to open that discussion. But I think that's where he was at the end of his life. Somehow that had to be confronted at some point. 
and I don't think he, I don't think he understood exactly what that meant. But he, the line that I think is simplest is that there would have to be a fundamental restructuring of the power structure of the economy that, that you couldn't get by with. I come out of liberalism. I used to work for liberal senators. Uh, you, would, you wouldn't get there from here with liberalism anymore. You couldn't get there with poverty programs. You couldn't get there with job programs. There would have to be systemic change. And worldwide, there would have to be something like revolution. Now, that's, that, we are not yet at that point where we're thinking about that. And I, I brought these quotes forward because I was surprised to see that he was ruminating on this larger, terribly difficult subject about whether a system like the, the most powerful advanced corporate capitalist system in the world might have to be transformed and maybe it could happen. Now that sounds out of, out of the ballpark, but that I think is what he was thinking about. And I don't know that he knew what to do with that, but I also think he was trying to struggle with what that meant. Um, so I offer it for that. Parenthetically, I, I've been writing, writing about related subjects and I was at, I was asked to speak to, this, this is, there are people thinking about this. I was asked to speak this year to the, the Academy of Management. I had never heard of the Academy of Management. It is 10,000 corporate specialists, mostly, law, mostly business school professors who advise major corporations. And they meet for a large, large conference. Uh, and the subject, and they meet each other, and they do business and so forth. The subject of the conference is, is capitalism in fundamental decay? And the only papers they will accept at this conference have to do with different aspects of the decline and collapse of capitalism. Now this is corporate specialists. And I'm running into this question that, from a different perspective that I think Dr. King was struggling with at the end of his life. And I offer it as, a, I think, a fact that we ought to drop in our laps collectively and look at and begin to mull whether or not he's right and whether or not we can get to struggle with that ourselves, or does the pain simply continue? Now, let me ask a, a follow-on to that, which is, in the 1960s, there was a narrative, at least among many whites, that we had become a middle-class society in which it was a broad middle class from which a minority was excluded. Many of the minorities were racial minorities, but it was 20%, 25%. And the dramatic feature of the 60s was that statistically the number of poor, the percentage of poor seemed to fall by half. And yet we now know that much of that poverty reduction was a consequence of Medicare and the expenditure of federal monies on the cost of medical care for the elderly, and that the non-elderly poor as a percentage did decline, and that today the number of non-elderly poor as a percentage of the population is pretty much what it was in Richard Nixon's time. What's, what is it that uh, won't allow us to uh, abolish poverty? And the minimum wage has not advanced beyond John F. Kennedy's 1963 numbers. Okay. If you would dust for inflation. Uh, I, I think there has, and again, we can go into this, but I think he may have sensed this. I think there's been a deepening weakness, weakness amongst the progressive groups and the traditional model of liberalism that I come out of. I'm a Wisconsin kid who worked for Wisconsin senators. The, the model depended fundamentally on, on the contention that labor as an organized force, unions could maybe counterbalance or countervail uh, against corporate power in the political arena. And I think that probably is the most important shift that's taken place. Labor's collapsed from 34% of the labor force. It's now at its peak in 1953. It's now down to around 11% and declining in the private sector to 6.6%. And virtually all the political economy studies make that link around the world with the declining labor, the capacity to alter any trends in the system decays. Quite apart from the fact of racism, which further exacerbates the problem in, in our country particularly. So I, I think we are in a very decaying period and likely to be decaying for a long time. But I also think that there are people who are beginning to ask questions. I think we're at the very early stages of asking questions. But where, where does it all go? I'm a historian, so I think in decade terms. And I, you know, systems change over time in significant part because of pain. But what struck me was that he was onto this in some way. He didn't see that the trends were moving. And I don't think he knew what to do with it. But he was willing to confront this challenging question. Is the system the problem? And if so, where does that take us? I mean, 
poverty programs would get us very small amounts, and jobs programs couldn't be passed, and pain continued. Lonnie, I, I want you to pick up on, uh, on an element of that story, which is to Americans, education has always been the primary means of getting out of poverty, joining the middle class, being more American. Harvard that you described, kind of the Radcliffe that you came to in the 1960s, and the Harvard of today look very different. And in terms of diversity, much has changed from when Dr. King was here. What more needs to change? Because as this process of diversity has taken place or taken hold at the university, it's been a period of increasing, not decreasing wealth and income inequality. What's going on? Well, it's, I don't think it's um, as simple as I'm about to say. <laughs> <laughs> but just to get started in terms of answering your question, one of the biggest differences between when I was a freshman at Radcliffe College, I think it, my tuition was $3,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Now, that's the same amount as it would have been to buy a car. So it's not that it was cheap, it's just that it wasn't as expensive as it is now. It's ridiculous. And so it's true that we have diversity on our campuses, but if you look at the um, class status, even of the black mm -hmm. students or the um, Asian students, disproportionately, um, they come from upper middle class households. And there's a, a, a study that a young woman did in, um, I guess it was 1999, in which she interviewed 175 of the black students at Harvard College. And now you don't have to say Harvard and Radcliffe, because Radcliffe has been consumed by Harvard. <laughs> and she, she, these students were, um, it, the names of these students were given to her by, I believe, the admissions office or by somebody who identified they were all sophomores. And of that group that she interviewed, she asked them to check off all the boxes that apply. So you weren't limited to any one box. And some large percentage of those 175 students did not check off black mm -hmm. as one of the things they were. Mm -hmm. But they had checked off black to get admitted to Harvard, but they didn't check it off when she was just doing a study to see how they identified. And what brought her to the study is, is, is that she was from North Carolina, and she would walk across campus and people would say, you know, what's your name, how are you doing, where are you from? And she'd say North Carolina, and they'd say, no, 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 where are you really from? Meaning that a disproportionate number of the black students at Harvard come from either Africa or from um, the Caribbean. And I'm not saying they shouldn't be at Harvard, but I'm saying that the black students from the South or from um, the Southwest are not being, um, they're, not, they're not being cultivated and Harvard is not reaching out to them. That's number one. And number two, I do think that there's a class advantage to anybody, or to, I, I should say to anybody, to a disproportionate number of students who get into Harvard because in order to fulfill the admissions requirements, you have to be able to take something called the SAT or the ACT. And you have to write a, um, you know, a biographical statement. And all of that is improved if you can afford a coach. And so you have people now who make a living coaching you on how to take the ACT or the SAT, coaching you on what to say in terms of your um, uh, description of yourself. And so in some ways, Harvard is not admitting the actual student, they're admitting its coach. Uh, is there a coach? Right? So, I could have used that coach, you know. <laughs> so so, uh, so I, do, I, I do think that that's a problem. On the other hand, I think there's another problem that's coming from the other side, and that is that the technology is such that being physically present is becoming less and less important because you can get on the web and hear the lecture of somebody who can um, I interact with somebody who is in the audience in real time. And so there's a lot of pressure and a lot of concern at this point 
for the idea of bringing people to a, a university as a physical space where they are going to be in some kind of harmony and, um, and literacy. But I do think that Harvard will not be, um, that, that, that Harvard will, will prevail as a university, but that won't be true of, of, of many other colleges because it's just too expensive to have to go to a place and live there for four years and have to pay $50,000 a year, meaning $200,000 in order to just get your BA. Let me, let me follow on. Yeah, let me just do it. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, Byron. Well, I, 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 I want to get back to this piece about, about sort of this, what, what, there was no doubt in my mind that the civil rights movement was not a success. It was a success for what it set out to do. And that, now, while it was doing that, a lot of people thought about other things that should be happening in this country. Um, but from the, and, and, and I'm not sure what would have happened if the people who were the, who were the leadership and, the, and, the, and sort of the intellectual uh, engine behind the civil rights movement had, had been able to be around for the next. I don't know what would have happened um, if Martin Luther King had been able to live through the Poor People's March. I'm not sure. But, I'm, but I am sure about this, that, that Almost every success where groups of people in this country um, have been able to change their position in this society for the better, it's because they, they, they themselves have decided they've had enough. That they themselves have said, Let's, we are going, this has to end. Now, many times their allies in that, their allies, um, are allies out, of, out of, from moral and intellectual positions, and many times they're allies because they are frightened to death that these people, that something might happen if these pe if, if these people are not allowed these changes. The civil rights movement, of course, was both of those things. Right? We had to be we we succeed. The civil rights movement succeeded because there were people, young people, old people ordinary people who said, we believe the time has come to vote. We really have to leave. And we're willing to demonstrate how much we believe that by taking these incredible risks in order to try to just to demonstrate registering to vote. And this, we ended slavery because they were slaves. We ended slavery because there were slaves that were running away. But more importantly, there were slaves that were burning the barns down. And there was fear. There was fear. Now it coincided with a lot of things that other people wanted. And that happened in the civil rights movement. There was a tremendous fear in this country that, they, that America would lose the propaganda fight with the communists if, they could, if, if the communists could keep saying, look at that racial segregation. Right? That's over and over again. Right? And so what we have is, and, and this is the piece that I'm not sure of. What we have been able to do in this country is to convince poor people that they can become middle class. Mm -hmm. and, and it's like convincing, see, if, if black people had been convinced that they could become white, it would have been a different movement. <laughs> and we laugh at that, right? But it, it is just as ridiculous to assume that poor people can become middle class in this country. And so I have people, literally, I have people who call me up who are annoyed because I want to raise the capital gains tax. And I say, how much money do you make? <laughs> and they say, but it's for our kids. We don't want our kids to have to pay a high capital. I think, and they believe their kids are going to be richer. They believe their kids are going to be richer. And we have, see, we have, we, you know, there are lots of, it's interesting that there are still parts of this country, in this world, where it's okay to be poor. Right? There are parts of this world where no one would think about calling themselves middle class. The, up, the, the euphemism for being poor is working class. Right? We don't have working class people anymore in the United States. And we have, and I really do believe that you wait for those times. I have no I who knew that the things that, were, that sparked the civil, the modern civil rights movement, 
the 20th century civil rights movement were going to happen. Who knew Emmett Kip Till was going to be murdered the way he was murdered, and he had a mother who said, oh no, I'm not going to let this be anonymous. Right? Who knew? Right? And we have to, and our job, our job, those of us who are not poor, right? which is all of us in this room or most, right? those of us who are not poor, what we have to do is to just make sure, just make sure that every time poor people do something outrageous right, and say that this has to end, that we are on their side. <laughs> Ready. All of us other organizers were getting ready for Vietnam summer and how we were going to do Vietnam summer in Roxbury. What we were going to do in Roxbury and how we were going to organize all those young black men. A group of welfare mothers went and took over the welfare office in Roxbury. Right? They stole the, the welfare office in Roxbury. The mayor had a complete connection. Sent the sent the police in, they stormed the building to bring them out, and, keep, and there was a riot that was our first urban violence in the city of Boston. Mm -hmm. right? So we got, so there was no, there was no Vietnam summer. I was certainly not going to go and deal with Vietnam summer, but I had all of these women who were a lot better organizers than I was asking for my help. <laughs> back to this issue of education and opportunity and ask you about the Supreme Court's current role, both in this Texas case and also in what has emerged over the last 10 years, which is in some sense a rejection of the move even toward systemic diversity of the kind we find in the universities with all the problems. Where are we at with this nation on this from your perspective from community college? Well, I would like to distinguish, in terms of your question, between where are we headed as a nation and where are we headed if we continue to be led by the Supreme Court of the United States. So those are two separate questions. What that means, at least trying to translate what I just said, is that for at least four justices of the Supreme Court, they think that identifying race, noticing race, observing race, admitting race, is all um, verboten. That, that there is something cruel and unusual about noticing somebody's race. So therefore, you can't talk about race. Because if you talk about race, then somehow you're noticing somebody else's race. And by noticing it, you are either <laughs> dismissing that, that other person or rejecting them in, in some way. So uh, what I've been thinking about, and this goes back in, 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 as well to what both you and um, Byron were talking about in terms of how do you get poor white people and poor black people and poor Latinos and poor white people <coughs> to work together to to make their presence known in, the, in this society. And I want to recommend to people a movie called The House I Live In, which is about uh, racialized mass incarceration, but it has a really important um, set of interviews with poor whites in the South, who are also, they've, they've been um, criminalized in the same way as poor blacks because they take various drugs. Mm -hmm. And they take the drugs because they're unemployed. And they can't find a job, so they're trying to make it from day to day. I'm not trying to justify what they're doing. I'm just acknowledging it. And there's no sense that the poor whites have anything in common with poor blacks who are also spending time in the penitentiary because they don't have any jobs. And so try, I think you were talking, Myron, about um, various ways to get poor people to be, number one, respected, but number two, to understand the connections that they have across racial um, lines. All right. Yeah. Let me uh, to open up the other side of this, if I may. Um, 
I think the war in poverty ran into the, the fact that the, nobody wanted to pay for it and nobody wants to pay for it today. And that, that's the reality we face given the organization of power. And I think it was dead ended and almost certainly would have been dead ended. And similarly in jobs program, I think that there is a strong understanding that it's better off for certain people to have a high unemployment rate. It reduces the pressure from below and it keeps corporations happy and they're quite happy with a decaying underclass. That's not a problem from the point of view of the banking community and, and major corporations. That's, a, that's a, a structural crisis which I think many of us understand or sense but I think is, is accurate. And our political capacities relative to that have weakened radically since the 1950s and 1960s, largely by the decline of labor. So I think that the, the whole, we, my, my view is that we are probably going backwards on things like war and poverty and the de efforts that need to be made, but I think it's a losing battle and that we're in very, very much more severe crisis than most people say, think. On the other hand, there are some interesting things going on that, that, that are pointing in a different direction. One of the figures that's most interesting in all this question that, that Dr. King was raising about the, the system, in a mere 400 people, Think about this number now. I, I, I didn't believe it until I checked it out several times. 400 individuals easily could get them in this room. Have more wealth, <coughs> leave aside income for the moment, wealth than the bottom 180 million people taken together. It is a concentration of wealth ownership that is extreme medieval. I actually said that in a lecture, and even the historian came up and said, no, it's never, never that concentrated. <laughs> But one, one of the things that, that is not being covered but we've been doing research on is that there are lots of efforts aimed at changing capital structure. Who gets to own it? So for instance, in Cleveland, there are very sophisticated, in, in black community, very sophisticated, large-scale industrial worker-owned cooperatives developing. And I mean, I mean large-scale, one of them is a, is a uh, urban greenhouse capable of producing three million heads of lettuce a year, not small partly being supported by purchasing power of the hospitals. And worker co-ops are a very big deal, right? And the younger people are getting active, black and white. Uh, the press doesn't cover this. There are a great interest in public banks, like, how many people know that there's a socialist bank in North Dakota? One of the most conservative states in the union has, for 90 years, had a public bank. This is very hot amongst a lot of organizers pointing in a different direction. What's the name of it? It's the same, <laughs> they think it's the bank of North Dakota? Yeah, State Bank of North Dakota. Bank of North Dakota. And so there are 20 states that have introduced legislation to produce public banks. Uh, there's a movement for neighborhood ownership, the land ownership, land trusts, but that changing capital structure is part of this. And it's coming out of pain. It's not coming out of, would it be nice? It's coming out of the old traditions of taxing and spending to achieve either jobs or wars on poverty are dead-ended. And partly because of the class of labor. So whether or not these, you know, there's a lot more going on than, than I described here, but whether or not we are in the preliminaries of a very long and agonizing period, which I think might be reminiscent of the late nine, the last three decades of the 19th century, where the system is in very great trouble with not, no capacity to solve problems, and then the anger builds and the experiments build. And I view this as that kind of era possibly but it, I don't think the old models are going to get us anywhere near. I think the power base of the old models are essentially disintegrated with the decline of the labor movement and the decline of that politics, which is the politics I came out of. I think, I think this is really important because um, uh, when, 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 when the downturn in the economy occurred um, a few years ago, um, I, in, in Massachusetts, I tried to get people to, to talk about it as being a depression rather than the Great Recession, right? And, and I got started, I, and I started to get back and started reading about the Depression. And one of the fascinating things about the Depression, and, and was that one thing, it was, it, was when the, it was when Massachusetts started raising taxes. We, we, the state raised that, we, now, we did it on a luxury item, gasoline, right? But that's when gasoline stack taxes started in Massachusetts, right in the middle of the Depression. But, one of the interesting things was when these proposals came up about things like social security and public housing from the Roosevelt administration, there was a whole left 
that have been talking about that stuff all the time. There are a whole bunch of people that have been thinking, oh, yeah, that, that, those, I, that's, what, that's what should happen. All the housing should be owned by the public. There should, you know, and so there was this whole group of people that he didn't have to worry about supporting these ideas. Right? We have none of that. Now we have, we, and 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 that is why the stuff in Cleveland, why here in Roxbury, when people say that they no longer want the government to sell any government-owned land in Roxbury again, mm -hmm. right? That all the development in Roxbury now is government land. The government has to keep owning, but the assumption that they're going to be able to have more control over that land than if it ever if it gets sold to to individual individual developers. Let me say another word about that because that, that, it's really important because I, I've been, people don't know much about this because the press doesn't cover it. This is, in some sense, it is potentially the, the two or three decades before the New Deal. The experiments that were going on in the cities, the so-called laboratories of, of democracy, that's where the real action was. And, and then Social Security came out of that, labor law came out of that, a number of the health and safety laws came out of that. And when the moment was right, there was a base developing. The press isn't covering much of this, but there are about like 10 million people involved in worker-owned companies in the United States, and probably most people in the room don't know that because the press doesn't cover it. There are 130 million people involved in co-ops, 40% of the population. There, there are developments at the grassroots, so I think largely on the pain because the old ways of trying to do this aren't working. Whether or not this is the prehistory of something is suggested, we don't know. But there's certainly a lot going on of this nature, and it most of it involves changing who gets to own in some democratic form. Coming out of pain is good. I mean, I think that's the old, only change that I know of in America that, that work comes out of pain. Somebody, right? <laughs> All right, I want you to pick up on the work that Dr. King enjoined us to bring together civil rights and peace in 1967 with the dilemmas that face President Obama today as America's first African-American president and what you think we must do to make this moment a moment of transformative <coughs> change for the kind of Dr. King was here. First, let me, let me say something about Martin Luther King. Um, uh, so, all the people who really got pissed at him like was a lie, raise your hand. Anybody here remember getting really pissed? Okay, thank you. Whoa! Huh? <laughs> If everybody who loved Martin Luther King, who tells you they loved was alive then, who tells you they loved Martin Luther King, right? He, I mean, we would have had everything. <laughs> the whole country, we would have had the whole country, we would have had the black president then, right? You know, I was opposed to Martin Luther King having a national birthday, so I lost that one. Um, but I have another idea. <laughs> but let me just say this: I think that that it is that King was quite remarkable. And that King, in lots of ways, and I was saying this at dinner, King, in lots of ways, is like Abraham Lincoln. And that is that he changed, but also he had all of these ideas that he didn't always express all at once, or we didn't hear about them all at once. And then he, get, and then he gets assassinated, and then for 40 years, he's like George Washington. You know what I mean? Right? And that same thing happened to Lincoln. It took a while before people started really talking about, I mean, thinking about and learning about what Lincoln was really like. Right? We're still in that in that sacred phase right now. You know, we can't. So that's why we can't we can't get kids to learn anything but the uh, I have a dream speech. Right? It's, and, you know, it's, a, it's the most radical thing we can do when we get together to celebrate Martin Luther King is to quote from the letter from the Birmingham jail. You know, and, and the reason why, and that's, and that, we'll get through that. We'll get through that. But we need to start just reading all that stuff. And one of the fascinating things about when you read all that stuff is he said little bits and pieces of this all the time. He was sort of, I and mean, he never was on, on one thing. Right? But clearly, in these, in those last years. Before he was assassinated, he was thinking of a, he was forced, I think, into having to decide, having to make a statement on war and peace. He was just he was forced into it because of, of the effect it was having on the black community. He was forced into it because of the effect it was having on the on the economy, how money was how federal money was spent, and he was forced into it because he believed it was wrong and had always believed it was wrong and had and felt that he hadn't said enough about that publicly. And then he knew that he had to, that if this country was going to change, 
there was, it was going to have to be with a bigger group of people than black people and white people who like black people. It had to be bigger than that. Right? And, that's, and, that, and, that was, and that was the attempt at, at organizing poor people and trying to figure out a way of getting poor people to identify themselves in a new way. So all of those things, um, I think, and I think we need to spend more time on that. That's why I think we should stop celebrating his birthday, and I think we should start celebrating, right, or commemorating his death day. <laughs> death day. <laughs> Birthdays, who cares? Who knew? <laughs> no one knew. Even his father didn't know. That's why he was called Michael. Was born. <laughs> so, the... <laughs> So, now, what does that mean for this first black president? The first black president is just that. He's the first black president. This is not Jesus. This is not even Martin. This is the first black president. Let him be the first black president. If, if Bobby Kennedy had, if prediction had been better, right? You know, Bobby Kennedy said we were going to have him sooner. Right? When Bobby Kennedy went, 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 made a, he made a speech and, he said, and they asked him when he thought, when he was someone, when do you have a colored president? Right? He said he was sure he would have color presidents, and this was about two years before Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, so two years. Two, this was about around the same time, 66 to 67, he said, in 10 years. So, that's what we have. Now, I suspect that we're going to have a very different person when he gets out of office. I think we have the person we're going to have for the next several years. We have a very different person when he gets out of office. You know, one of the reasons why Martin said that he had to make the speech at Riverside was that he did, he had gotten the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> well, President has the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> it might haunt him also uh, after he gets out of office. Where do we carry this struggle? I mean, we talked about trying to find alliances among the poor, again, you know, Gar and all of us understand that the pressures that are operating in this global economy are decreasing that, that portion of the population that once thought of themselves as middle class or having the opportunity to become middle class. And part of what I heard you say, Gar, was that there are great risks attended to this not just opportunities, and in fact, I heard more about the risks than the opportunities. As increasing economic pressure widens and draws more people into what feels like either a stalled life or one that's going backward or downward, where, where do we go? What do we do? Can I just add sure. a moment to that question? <laughs> so I think that, um, and this is, question to you, Gar, as well, is this correct? That part of the challenge we face is to get poor white people to understand that they have a lot in common with poor black people. Mm -hmm. And the only way to do that is to increase the amount of racial literacy in this country, meaning that right now people assume certain things about other people based on the fact that they are black or brown or yellow or white. Or white. And the, if you go back to the example I gave earlier regarding Central High School, you had um, working class whites angry 30 years later after desegregation because they felt that the working class blacks had somehow stolen the opportunity they had because it had renegotiated the people that they were going to be connected to. That is, they were now going to be uh, going to school with poor black people, they're poor, so now it, instead of increasing their opportunities, they're decreasing and becoming like black people, right? That's, that's the um, narrative that I think fueled a lot, of, uh, a lot of the fire. So how do you get white people and black people to become more racially literate? Which goes back also to your earlier question about diversity and how do you get people to come together in a, um, a problem solving fashion in which they're going to respect other people's experiences and of course just negate them or um, critique them. So it, 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 to me that's a fundamental change, a fundamental challenge 
in this society is to get white people, black people, brown people, yellow people to figure out that the American dream is really a crutch, right? And it's a crutch for the wealthy because for most people they think, well, if they work hard and play by the rules, they'll succeed. And then if they don't succeed, they need to have, you know, some explanation so they then go to race. Right? Oh, well, the reason we didn't succeed is the black people stole the American dream from us, the Latinos, the immigrants stole the American dream from us. And I think we really need to work on a different narrative that enables poor people to see that they have tremendous um, connection, attachment, relationship with other poor people. It's not that race is irrelevant, but that people have to be able to negotiate through race to get to issues of play. I wish I had the answer for <laughs> But let me say, I, I do think, um, what I think, the, the, what, what is emergent in this conversation, and what I was trying to suggest was emergent at the end of Dr. Like, King's life, is, and this is the hard place, that we are really entering a very different era. Really. Not just in a light way. And that the system is in decay, in many parts of the society, except for very extreme concentrations. The concentrations are extreme, they are medieval. And that means that the old techniques and the old strategies are, we're gonna to have to walk on two legs. I like this Chinese expression. We're gonna to have to do whatever we can the old ways, like bringing together the old alliances has been, hold the line, but the line is going backwards, not forward. Nonetheless, it's important to hold the line and to build the whole different racial understanding. And some of that will help because of the Hispanic vote and the black vote becoming significant that made me understand politically of that. But what I think, and it's very hard to think that we may be at a period of American history where fundamental issues are going to be on the table, very fundamental issues, and that the prehistory of something like the next New Deal may be there. The thing that I find very interesting, and the press does not cover this, but we've done a lot of research on it, is that there are enormous numbers of experiments, all of which involve changing ownership, black and white ownership in different forms, land trusts, city governments setting up ownership, transforming worker-owned companies, co-ops, and the press hasn't covered it, but it changes the paradigm because when you go to wealth, as the night as Occupy said, it, it really is, the top one percent or one tenth of percent and the 99 and that's a totally different division of the politics of politics and they again i see this as a historian of the, whether or not over the next period including the hispanic increases and the, and the obvious possibility of a new alliance that there may be a time of building up the models of where to go uh, my my model and my suggestion i have one suggestion for practical activity uh, except uh, I've written a book about this other thing, lots of practical like, options and that. But I, I have uh, fond remembrances of the women's movement in the 1960s, and I suspect there's some voices here. And, and here was the motto, and here's how it appears. Chairman Mao was asked, how did, where does power come from? And he said, it comes from a barrel of a gun. And the women's movement said, mm, not so fast. It comes from a half a dozen women getting together reading something and finding out something new and then figuring out something you could do locally and then supporting each other. And I think we're at a time where reflection and learning and deepening and small group building are the prehistory of the next politics that may build on some of the experiments I'm talking about. But it is a walk on two legs, do whatever we can do the old ways. But here's the hard part, that, and this is why I raise these questions about King's vision at the end. And whether the person sitting in your chair and my chair can actually see ourselves as involved in that, rather than just doing what we've done and hoping that would work. Because that requires stretching. And it requires an existential confrontation with yourself. And I think that's what he was doing. And I think he was struggling with it, trying to figure it out. I don't think he knew where it was going to end. But I think he got the sense that that was the problem. And I, I think if we want to commemorate and think about the better parts of Martin Luther King, there are many parts, that's the one that stands out for me.
the end of the hour and a half that we've committed to this conversation. And so I think that I want to leave you all with a question that perhaps can form part of the discussion that we have among ourselves going forward. And that question is, is a voice like Dr. King's capable of being heard today? And having heard what you've heard tonight, are you prepared to hear what he said in 1967 here and move it forward almost a half century to pass on what he sought to teach us that you might teach to others? I want to thank our operatives. I want to thank the line for the air. the challenges ahead. I'm also returning home to join more vigorously the war against poverty. You may not realize how many poor people there are in our world. There are millions of people still going to bed hungry at night all over our world. I've been in India on those dark and lonely nights. I've seen with my own eyes thousands of people sleeping on the sidewalks at night, had no beds to sleep in, no houses to go in. In Bombay alone, more than a million people sleep on the sidewalks at night. In Calcutta, more than 600,000. I've been all over Africa and seen the poverty of our black brothers and sisters. I've seen it in South America. Almost two-thirds of the people of the world are hungry. They've never seen a doctor or a dentist. They barely have the earnings to pay the taxes and certainly not to gain the basic necessities of life. I'm concerned about this, but in our own nation, there are some 10 million families comprising between 40 and 50 individuals who are poor people. They find themselves on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. If America is to be a great nation, she's got to solve this problem. And I don't believe anybody who will tell me that this problem can't be solved. I've just returned from Sweden and Norway. In those two countries, you have no unemployment. You have no slums. And if these countries in Scandinavia much less powerful, much smaller resources can grapple with these problems of unemployment, the problems of slums and ghettos. What can we do in the United States if we have the will to do it, the richest nation in the world? The problem is that so often we don't see the poor. Mr. Harrington has a book entitled The Other American. He calls the poor the invisible poor. This is so often true. Jesus tells us something that we must never forget. Inasmuch as ye do it unto the least of these, my brethren, ye do it unto me. Jesus tells us a story, a magnificent parable about a rich man named Dives and a poor man named Lazarus. If you remember that story, you will remember that Dives ended up going to hell. That is nothing in that story that tells us that Dives went to hell merely because he was rich. Jesus never made a universal indictment against all wealth. It is true that on one occasion, he talked to the rich young ruler and said, sell all, but in that situation, he was prescribing individual surgery rather than setting forth a universal diagnosis. And you will remember. You 
will follow that parable in all of its symbolic structure. You will remember that when Diabetes was in hell, he had a conversation with a man named Abraham in heaven. Remember, it wasn't a millionaire in hell talking with a poor man, man in heaven. On the other end of that long distance call between heaven and hell was a real rich man. It was a little millionaire in hell talking with a multi-millionaire in heaven. <laughs> Diabetes went to hell because he passed by Lazarus every day and he never saw him. Diabetes went to hell because he allowed Lazarus to become invisible. Diabetes went to hell because he allowed the means by which he lived to outdistance the ends for which he lived. Diabetes went to hell because he maximized the minimum and minimized the maximum. <laughs> Diabetes went to hell because he failed to use his wealth to bridge the gulf that separated him from Lazarus. And this is what we face today. We have the least of these among us who are the least of these. They are God's children who wake up every morning standing at tiptoe stands not knowing what to expect next. Who are the least of these? They are the boys and girls who get up day after day and have nothing to look forward to because they can't find a job. Who are the least of these? They are the people who see life as nothing but a long and desolate corridor with no exit sign. Who are the least of these? They are people who see no hope, no way out. Who are the least of these? They are the people who have been deprived of educational opportunities. Who are the least of these? They are the people at the bottom of the economic ladder. It seems that I can hear someone standing before the God of the universe saying, Master, I've done my job. I've gotten a lot of education. I've been to the great universities. Yes, Master, I've done well and I've been able to rise to the great heights of economic security. Seems that I can hear the Master responding by saying, but I was hungry and you fed me not. I was sick and ye visited me not. I was naked and ye clothed me not. I was in prison and you were not concerned about me. Therefore, you are not fit to enter the kingdom of righteousness. This is the So we have a challenge today more than ever before to get rid of poverty in our nation and I assure you that I will give my life whatever limited resources I have to join with the great president of our nation and all of the great leaders in the various communities and states in our nation to engage in this war on poverty this is one war in which we can't afford to have any conscientious objector. Everybody must join this war. <laughs> I come to you saying that I still believe that America has the resources, even the will, to respond to the challenges of this hour. I refuse to accept the idea that man is so caught up in this evil system of racial injustice that he can rise to new marvelous heights of brotherhood. I refuse to accept the idea Man is little more than a tiny vagary of whirling electrons or a wisp of smoke from a limitless smoldering. I refuse to accept the notion that man is nothing but a cosmic accident, a disease on this planet not soon to be cured. I refuse to accept the idea that we can't rise up and reach the glad day of peace and brotherhood. So tonight I stand before you with a belief. I believe that the day can come right here in America and all of God's children 
will live together as brothers. I believe that there will be a day when justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. I believe there will be a day my brothers and sisters in Harlem will not have to live in rat-infested slums and depressing ghettos, but will be able to live with decency and honor and have their self-respect and personhood. I believe today. I believe that we have the resources to transform this pending cosmic energy into a creative psalm of peace. I believe that even Mississippi, a closed society, can be Mississippi, an open society one day. I believe that Mississippi, which has an affinity for the bottom, can one day have an affinity for the top. I believe somehow that things can get better and dark yesterdays can be transformed into bright tomorrows. I believe that the dignity and the worth of human personality will be respected one day. I believe this and I live by it. This has been a marvelous day in my life, a marvelous week in my life. I've been so happy and moved today by the great words that have been uttered by so many wonderful people, the great welcome that Mayor Wagner has given me to this great city. I've been so moved. I've been so moved by experiences that I had in Europe, meeting hundreds and thousands of people of goodwill. So I tell you, my friends, for the last 10 days, I've been on a literal mountaintop, having transfiguring experiences. Oh, we've had the privilege of meeting and talking with kings and queens, meeting and talking with prime ministers of nations, meeting and talking with the humble people of the land. I would love to stay here because it's a marvelous mountain. And I can tell you that it does mean a little something because I do live almost every day under the threat of death and it is a fit contrast to have people saying nice things about you. It would be nice if I could stay up here. I wish I could stay on this mountain top. For it isn't the usual pattern of my life to have people saying nice things about me. Oh, this is a marvelous mountaintop. I wish I could stay here tonight, but the valley calls me. There's still... I wish I could stay here tonight. I wish I could stay on this great mountain of transfiguration that has come to me over these last 10 days, but there are some 970 odd million of my black brothers and sisters down in the state of Mississippi, most of whom can't register and vote. I've got to go back to the valley, my friend. I wish I could stay here. I would love to continue to pass through the lines and meet the great people of the world. Oh, there are some humble people down in the valley. Their little children are born every day. And clouds of inferiority are floating in their little mental skies because they don't think they're anybody. And somebody's got to give them hope. I've got to go back to the valley and try to give them a little hope. I wish I could stay on this mountain top tonight. I wish the last 10 days could somehow be stretched out ad infinitum, but somehow something reminds me. Millions and millions of God's children, and many of them are white, are 
caught in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society. And because of my concern for humanity, I've got to go back to the valley and try to help them. I wish I could stay here tonight. Oh, if I could stay here tonight, that would be one thing. But the valley calls me. There are those who need hope. There are those who need to find a way out. And so I thank you for allowing me to be on the mountaintop. I want to thank Oslo for allowing me to be on the mountaintop for a few days. But I've got to go back to the valley. And as I go back to this valley, I go back with a faith. And it isn't a weak faith. Oh, I say to you tonight, my friends, I'm not speaking as one who has never seen the burdens of life. I've had to stand so often amid the chilly winds of adversity, staggered by the jostling winds of persecution. I've had to stand so often amid the surging murmur of life's restless sea, but I go back with a faith. It is a faith that evil, triumphant, is somehow weaker than right defeated. I go back with a faith that truth crushed earth will rise again. I go back with a faith that the mills of the gods grind slowly but exceedingly fine. I go back with a faith that you shall reap what you sow. With this faith, I go back to the valley. I will say as I've said all over America, that working together, cooperating together, black and white together, we will be able to speed up the day when all of God's children will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last.